Welcome to the Orton Gillingham Podcast, a Brainspring production. Today, we'll speak with Dr. Elena Forzani and Dr. Andrea Bien, two former elementary teachers and current professors at Boston University, about the importance of comprehension instruction and why students need to develop multiple skills to become good readers. Today, we are continuing our series on the pillars of reading. In this series, we are devoting an entire episode to each of the five pillars to develop a greater understanding of why each pillar is essential for reading proficiency. Our last episode was all about phonemic awareness, and now we are skipping ahead to comprehension. Today, we're very excited to be joined by Dr. Elena Forzani and Dr. Andrea Bien from Boston University. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, can we start out by having you introduce yourselves and telling us a little bit about your background and how your article, A Focus on Phonics or Comprehension, really came to be? Yes, for sure. Elena, do you want me to jump in? Sure, go for it. Okay. Yeah, we were elementary school teachers, um, as you just mentioned, and now our literacy professors. I have a PhD in literacy curriculum and instruction. Um, and I'm a clinical professor at BU, at the Boston University Wheelock College of Education. So the clinical in my title just kind of signals that I, I teach a lot. I am primarily a teacher educator. I still spend a good amount of time in schools working with kids and working with teachers. Um, and so this is related, of course, to how the article came to be because um, around fall of 2022, so a year and a half ago, reading instruction kind of exploded in the mainstream media, right? There was one particular podcast that really was driving the national conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as, as reading people, right, as a, as a reading professor, as a reading instruction teacher educator, I think a lot about reading all the time. Mm -hmm. But to see that level of commercial success is pretty unusual. So mm -hmm. I started paying attention and the unfiltered version of how that led to us writing the article is that I think we were we were concerned, right? Maybe a little bit mad because mm -hmm. there was so much information circulating, but a lot of it was really misrepresented. And so we, or I should, I'll speak for myself. Elena mm -hmm. will tell her version of this, mm -hmm. but I started talking with colleagues at BU kind of thinking about why is this resonating with so many people and what are the implications of this conversation? Like what lies on the other side of this? And so that's where the concern came in is that we started to feel concerned that there was going to be an overcorrection mm -hmm. because the national conversation was so hyper-focused mm -hmm. on phonics. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there was an opportunity there for us to chime in, right? And offer maybe what we were thinking of as a more like balanced mm -hmm. perspective. Um, but I think ultimately it was also like a sense of responsibility. Elena and I had a lot of conversations about wanting someone, particularly maybe someone very senior in the field to publish something that was saying, yes, phonics is important, but we mm -hmm. can't focus only on phonics. Like mm -hmm. we can't lose sight of the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we weren't seeing that sort of quickly enough, we realized that maybe it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to offer a point of view that um, is comprehensive and accessible. So that felt really important. I think part of the reason that the conversation nationally was so popular is because people felt like they could access that conversation when maybe previously it just had not been on their radar. Mm -hmm. But even though we wanted to offer a point of view that was accessible, we didn't want to lose the nuance, right? I mean, we, mm -hmm. we live in a time of clickbait and polarization mm -hmm. and you know, nuance isn't particularly popular in a climate mm -hmm. like that. But we, we knew that in order to be helpful to the kids mm -hmm. and the teachers and the parents who were trying to make sense of this, mm -hmm. that we, um, we should try to present a point of view that says that acknowledged, yes, phonics is super important, mm -hmm. but it is one piece of it. And if mm -hmm. we lose sight of that, we're not going to meet our goals, which mm -hmm. is helping kids become better readers. So mm -hmm. for that reason, I kind of have started thinking about this piece as as 
like a reading wars peace treaty. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, and I'm sure Elena is going to mention this, but we originally to, in, to that end, we originally had a different title for mm -hmm. our article. We really intentionally tried to avoid a phonics comprehension binary. Right. Um, and so the, the real title of our article was it's like riding a bike. Uh, to develop good readers, teach them to coordinate multiple mm -hmm. skills to make meaning. Because mm -hmm. um, we have this bike metaphor sure. in the article, but mm -hmm. that got that got thrown out and then replaced by phonics or comprehension. But right, we right. don't really sort of embrace that binary. Right, right. I mean, it should be a red flag to anybody if anybody it's says this is all you need. You know, if mm -hmm. if if anybody is saying all you need is phonics, that's a red flag, a big time red flag. And I think that's mm -hmm. the message, hopefully, that you were you were hoping to get out is that of course you need you need everything, you know. Um, so so yeah, definitely that's one thing we want to make sure people understand is you should never hear one way or the other exclusively, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So Elena, right. so what is your um, take on this? And please tell us yeah. about yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think Andrea has, you know, put it really well. Um, and of course, Andrea and I um, have talked a lot about this over the last few years. But um, I am, an, you know, as you said, a ele former elementary school teacher. Um, but I also taught high school um, and high school reading. And so I think that really um, gave me a perspective sort of at both ends of the mm -hmm. spectrum mm -hmm. um, and about just how complex reading is and how all the different domains that, you know, you mentioned that it sounds like you're going through really work together to, mm -hmm. to help kids um, read mm -hmm. and to help kids comprehend, which is the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, a few years ago, I was coming out of a process of working on the new NAEP reading framework. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, the podcast that Andrea just yes, mentioned, <laughs> how it came into play. And so I, I listened to it. And, and of course, also, I think before I ever interacted with the podcast, I was reading articles, particularly in the New York Times, mm -hmm. um, about how phonics was the answer specifically to better reading comprehension test scores, which often got framed as NAEP. And at the time, you know, I had just come out of like designing these tasks or designing what the task should look like. And so in my mind, there was a disconnect between, you know, phonics is not going to get kids, it's not going to be sufficient enough to get kids to being able to reason and comprehend in these complex ways with the mm -hmm. kinds of complex ta ta tasks that are on NAEP, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to take mm -hmm. NAEP as an example, mm -hmm. which of course is, you know, there are so many other ways kids make meaning, sure. but if you're going to start with the test, like, let's talk about that. Yes. Um, so that honestly really angered me as I listened to the podcast, because I felt like um, I was very concerned, and I still worry about this, that the, you know, what was going to happen is that we were just going to swing to phonics, 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 and mm -hmm. forget that there are all these other things that mm -hmm. matter mm -hmm. to, to um, you know, for kids to be able to reason and make meaning with text. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really that narrow lens that mm -hmm. was the problem for me. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I taught first grade. So uh, I, I come from a frame of like, obviously, you teach phonics. That was never a question for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Um we have a code-based language. Kids mm -hmm. need to learn that code. Mm -hmm. So that was just sort of a given. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's been my concern is that we focus on this, this small thing. So I was, and then at around that time too, that I was listening to the podcast and reading these stories, I was at a meeting with some other senior mm -hmm. colleagues. Um, and I, I think I asked them like, Hey, are you know, who's going to write an article in specifically in the New York times, like speaking back to, to this narrative, because mm -hmm. at the time the, the New York times wasn't running any counter narratives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so as Andrea said, like I kept waiting and, and even asked people like, Hey, you're perfectly positioned to do this. Are you going to do this? Mm -hmm. And the answer was kind of like, well, we are doing this. You know, we put a position statement here. We wrote this article in this other academic journal over here. 
And so at that point, I realized, as Andrea said, um, I felt like, okay, if nobody else is going to, you know, try to write something back in, in a public forum, not, a, not, an, ac- not an academic forum, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, this is something I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that became even more salient when um, the co- our college actually brought uh, Emily Hanford as a speaker. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I asked her, are you concerned that the country might you know, sort of swing to a font, might listen to your podcast and think that all we need to do is focus on phonics and that will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, no, I'm not worried about that at all. At all. I said, don't you feel like you have a responsibility to educate the American public? And the answer was no. And I do think that, you know, we, we had a problem with some schools not teaching phonics. Mm -hmm. And that was a very real problem Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, Emily's podcast um, and other articles have done a good job to address. Mm-hmm. Um, it just would be nice if we had a little more nuance to it. And I mm-hmm. think that the conversation is starting to become a little more nuanced sure. because people have said, you know, wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> like there are all yeah. other things that go into reading. When I think about the podcast that you're referring to, I feel like, I feel like the focus of it was not so much you don't need comprehension, mm-hmm. but rather look at this very specific program that many, 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 many schools use. And I felt like it was more of a commentary on that, that very specific approach. Um, that's how I took it anyway. It was, it was, um, it was more of a, more of a, um, a, an expose on don't, don't, do cueing, you know, don't do, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so, I mean, I feel like any thinking, any thinking educator, um, wouldn't jump to a conclusion like all or nothing, as I mentioned before. So, um, that, that might be the way a lot of people, I mean, it was a very well done podcast and it was very, um, I mean, it, it, it was irrefutable at, at some point, you know, that, that kids are not, not all kids are learning to read using that method. But I, I feel like, um, I feel like not everybody possibly jumped to the conclusion that don't ever do, only do phonics because of that podcast. Now, there's this whole science of reading push, of course, and, um, and, and that is a very big focus in, in a lot of the research as well. Um, but again, it shouldn't be the only, it's not the only way, and it's not the only uh, component of learning to read. And so, uh, again, anybody doing their research, um, looking at all of this together, um, using theoretical models that, you know, are frankly, are, are kind of older. Like, I mean, we think of Scarborough's rope, right? Um, and, and, you know, clearly um, there's a, a, a word recognition portion of Scarborough's rope, which is phonics, right? But mm-hmm. we can't forget that there's that old, whole other part of that, which is the language comprehension piece, which includes all of the wonderful background knowledge, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, so, any program, and this is for people who are, you know, thinking about, oh, what, I wonder what my kid's program at school is doing, or, um, or if I'm an, an educator, we're looking for a new program. You know, anybody telling you um, or not putting it into perspective what they're providing um, needs to be questioned. So we, we teach, we have a phonics-based program that we teach. It's called Phonics First. <laughs> it's pretty phonics-based, right? But the very beginning, at the very first day, we say, we're only one little piece, one little piece. Mm. And you can't, you can't negate all of the other, um, you know, uh, components of reading. You're never going to get to a skilled reader unless you have these language comprehension pieces. So, so, so I think that it's, it's, it's absolutely a balance as you are mentioning. And, um, and I, and I hope that's what people are taking away from, um, you know, your article and, um, and also being really thinking, real, uh, thinking um, when they're, when they're evaluating programs. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I just went way off and just started uh, got, getting on a soapbox. But um, what, back to, back to this, the NAEP scores. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
they're, they are causing alarm, aren't they? I mean, people, we hear about it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is contributing to those low scores? What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, first, um, you know, I think that we we've seen alarm over NAEP scores for as long as NAEP has existed, right? right. This is so I think it's important to keep that in context. Mm -hmm. um, I think another contextual factor that's important for people to keep in mind is that NAEP's cut points, this, the way the scores are reported, mm -hmm. are meant to be aspirational. So they're, they're meant to be like a little bit above what we would actually expect students to be able to do at that grade level. Um, so they're always going to be, you know, I feel like the scores are always going to be a little bit lower than what we mm -hmm. would think kids, how kids should be perform at that grade level. Um, another thing that I think is really important to keep in mind with any assessment is that as good as any assessment is, um, you know, it, it it's never it gonna, it, it's always going to be one, um, one data point. Sure. And it's never going to represent necessarily all of the readers that take a given assessment. And mm -hmm. I say that, um, you know, believing truly that the current um, tasks on the NAEP that's being developed um, mm -hmm. and the tasks that are currently be, being given are, are generally like good tasks. Mm -hmm. But can we do a better job representing the diverse students across mm -hmm. the nation? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you mentioned Scarborough's Rope, which comes out of the simple view. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also um, part of the issue has been in the way that schools have taken that up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even the simple viewer Scarborough's Rope is still just one small piece of mm -hmm. the, the reading puzzle. Mm -hmm. And the active view, I think, is a more comprehensive piece. Mm -hmm. And even the active view is situated within a sociocultural context. Mm -hmm. And we know that children's reading practices vary across contexts, across sociocultural contexts. We, we have lots of research that shows that the kinds of reading practices and values um, differ to some extent, right? Obviously, there are a lot of things in common, but they do differ to some extent depending mm -hmm. on children's sociocultural contexts. Can can uh, you can you guys speak to what you think is contributing to the low scores, though? Like what? Like where where do you assess that at? Yeah. So one the number one thing I would say is that I think that we don't give and of course, this is just my we don't have good evidence about why. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we don't fund mm -hmm. in this country better measures that would help us understand why kids are performing poorly on NAEP, mm -hmm. um, despite like recommending that we do that. Um, but I think one huge thing that that I think and I totally is that we don't give children enough opportunities to engage in reasoning with text on a mm -hmm. deep level and reasoning with a content purpose, not reasoning to like practice a strategy in a content vacuum, mm -hmm. but having a real disciplinary or a real content purpose for engaging in that text. And I'm mm -hmm. talking about deep conversation, using mm -hmm. evidence with text mm -hmm. or using evidence from text, reasoning with evidence, mm -hmm. disagreeing with one another, both mm -hmm. in in writing and in discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so many of those rich opportunities to make meaning in complex ways have been removed from the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, in past years, mm -hmm. as we've taken, yes, like as we've taken out science and social studies from elementary classrooms, um, as we focused on teaching strategies, often in a content vacuum. Um, so I think those rich opportunities um, need to come back to the classroom, even at kindergarten, even at Absolutely. first grade. Absolutely. You know, yes. When we're the, some of the focus on the science of reading has has, you know, positions reading as, you know, kids learn to read in K2. And so they don't need to, to like have right. these rich opportunities right. to make meaning yet, but they do. Yeah. I think a huge thing that's missing is, is the idea that, you know, where the heck is oral language in all this? Oral language plays a huge piece. And so does content area. Um, as you're mentioning, I mean, you, you, it's, it's not done in a vacuum. And so, um, I mean, think about oral reading and, and where would you, um, can you can you talk about that as far as um, how that contributes to to comprehension? 
Sure. When you say oral reading, you mean like I don't reading. mean oral me reading. I mean oral, oral language. Or I'm sorry, oral language. Yes. Yeah. Sure. And and Andrea, feel free to jump in because I know I've been talking a lot. But um, you know, we know that um, content knowledge or background knowledge it contributes hugely to reading, and we can change the topic of a text. And if a child doesn't have the topic knowledge, they don't understand. Um, you know, when my mm -hmm. husband speaks to me about baseball, um, mm -hmm. I, half the time, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't have that vocabulary. I don't mm -hmm. have the background knowledge. I truly like can't understand what he means. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hugely important. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And in oral language is the beginning of, I mean, you have, you have to be able to put together thought and, and ideas and just like you will when you're eventually start writing, you know, so it's the basis of, of that as well. So, um, so that's, yeah, I think, I think that's a conversation that gets lost often is that, you know, content area, um, discussion and, uh, across the board, you know, gets, gets lost is where it fits in to reading and writing, you know, it needs to be, it needs to be integral to, to those pieces. So, um, <clears throat> one thing about the NAEP scores is they've remained flat for what, 20 years? I mean, it's not, it doesn't seem to be, it's just hovering. Yes, it's, it's not, it, yeah. in, 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 regardless of what we t tend to be doing in classes and, and what, what philosophy we're following, it is staying the same. And how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, another thing we haven't really talked about are, of course, um, systemic injustices mm -hmm. in society <laughs> um, that, you know, contribute from the ground up to fewer opportunities for um, for children from marginalized communities to mm -hmm. have learning, you know, have learning opportunities, number one. Mm -hmm. um, and number two, like maybe the the tests, the tasks and things that we design on NAEP or on any assessments aren't necessarily the kinds of reading practices that children from less dominant communities would would define as sure. mattering to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's also important. So so I think like we can't we can't know, and there are there are a lot of problems, right? But I think it's important that we start from a systemic perspective and thinking about the injustices that exist at society that create those um, those problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, I think like you know if we if we teach phonics better, um, is that going to help? Absolutely, right. But it's gonna it's gonna help to a certain extent, you know, as we've seen in England, for example. Um, but it's not gonna uh, it's not gonna get us all the way there. There are all these other pieces, um, and and I'm sure Andrea, you might have things too to add. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things when going back to the previous question, which is like why are people so concerned about NAEP scores, right? Like, why does it ring alarm bells? And I mean, in addition to the reasons that Alina is saying, I think um, there's also the piece that we have to remember, which is because we understand that reading is fundamental to our full participation in society. And mm -hmm. so when we have this idea that kids are not reading and we're not reading well and we're not making progress, it's, it's really scary, right? right? Because if they're our kids or our students or it's, mm -hmm. or it's the nation in which we live, right? And we're thinking about our future, we need people to be able to be fully literate, to fully participate mm -hmm. in society. But um, I think there's maybe like two things that in addition to what Elena has said that might be contributing to, um, to what's sort of going on about them, why we're not making progress. And one is I think, as Elena said, assessments are always going to index like the worldview of whoever is designing those assessments. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if mm -hmm. the room is full of the dominant group, right. If we're looking at a room full of white middle-class, you know, able-bodied people, all the different dominant isms, then right. There's a chance that that assessment isn't doing a good job of measuring how all students are progressing. And mm -hmm. so I think we should be concerned about the students. And I think we also have a responsibility to look at the actual assessment and kind of keep revisiting and retooling, which that's the work that Elaine has been so involved in. Um, so I think that's probably part of it. And then I also think, I mean, even as we're having this conversation, we learn to read so that we can 
be readers, right? Like we don't learn phonics to use phonics. We right. learn phonics because it, we're, we're trying to like crack this code so that we can engage with literacy because that's how we navigate the world. Mm-hmm. That's how we connect with people. That's how we understand what's going on. It's how we do our jobs. And so I think there's, it's possible that there's this authenticity piece that's missing from instruction because we have to, as teachers, think about like, how do we deconstruct this process Mm -hmm. into like the five pillars, like Mm -hmm. we're naming, right? Mm -hmm. And teach kids like, okay, we have to teach word recognition. We have to Mm -hmm. teach fluency. We have to teach vocabulary. We have to teach comprehension. Mm -hmm. But ultimately the reason that we're doing all of that is so that kids and readers have the skills that they need to coordinate all the time. Using not the end goal. It's not the end right. goal. Right. And so if, if instruction doesn't reflect the real ways that we use literacy, mm-hmm. it seems unlikely then that that kids will perform well on assessments that are designed to measure more authentic ways of using literacy. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I, and I'm this is not a knock on teachers or mm-hmm. schools. Like I really do identify as a teacher and, and I'm constantly thinking about how can we do this better. Um, because schools like this sort of artificially organized place where we're trying mm-hmm. to teach skills and we're trying to teach content. And then there's an expectation that we can take all of that and generalize it to our lives. Mm-hmm. And so we also have to consider our readers using literacy in their lives in the ways that we expect. And mm-hmm. that's where like the sociocultural context within which we're doing that work matters profoundly, mm-hmm. right? It really mm-hmm. matters. You know, what are my literacy and language practices? Are they represented in schools? Are they represented on these assessments? Um, because if not, it's unlikely that I'm going to score well or do right. well. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it really has to be, phonics really does need to be seen as a means to the end, right? It, it's something that absolutely, once you learn it and it becomes automatic, you should never have to think about it again. I mean, now we're on to bigger and better things, right? Um, understanding why and analyzing and, you know, comparing and just learning about life, you know? So so I think I think that, that that's a, another important message that, as you say, um, it's it's not the be all end all. It's it's just a means to the end, right? Um, I, yeah, and and based off of what you said, um, how do you envision the phonics piece being incorporated in you know into this this realm? Because you you said that we've you know we've kind of maybe focused on it too much. So how do you think we should it should be focused on? So uh, interesting, I think maybe in recent years, because there's this national conversation that like it it happens periodically, right? There's like this reading wars conversation, Mm -hmm. but I don't actually think this is real at the practice level. Mm -hmm. I think this is a conversation that plays out in national discourse and it can sometimes influence then what happens in schools or um, you know, how we're making policy, maybe. But I feel like as teacher educators, as researchers, as teachers, what we're really thinking about is um, how to embed phonics in authentic literacy instruction, right? So sure, mm-hmm. we need to practice phonics and practice skills, and it requires, you know, systematic, explicit, direct instruction, Mm -hmm. but in the service of engaging authentically with text. And so Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would say schools are focusing on it too much. I think there's a national conversation that was hyper-focused on it. Mm -hmm. And so I worry about how that positions teachers and maybe what curricula gets adopted in Mm -hmm. sort of like a, a an impulsive response. Mm -hmm. But I think in classrooms, I don't think I would say that they're focusing on phonics too much. And I think one of the things, as you Mm -hmm. pointed out, is is the podcast probably exposed that there were some places where Mm -hmm. there was not enough phonics instruction, which to be clear, Elena and I were really shocked, Mm -hmm. shocked, because that's not what we teach in teacher education. That's not how we're kids. And so, so I just want to clarify that, that I, I think that, um, there is a difference between a hyper-focus on phonics and a big conversation nationally and what happens in classrooms. What's going on in classrooms is, is so, is very, 
normally organic, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you give the kids what they need, um, and and you, regardless of what's going on in the news, you know, teachers are in there doing what they need to do, and mm -hmm. um, and I think um, I think you're right. I think it gets exaggerated quite a bit um, in news or whatever. Um, absolutely. Um, so when you, when we talk about, I mean, we are kind of talking about comprehension as one of the pillars today, um, in a roundabout way, but when you, when you think about comprehension, what, um, what is comprehension instruct, instruction involve? I mean, when you're talking about mm -hmm. how do you teach comprehension? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, and, and the other thing I was going to say about phonics instruction, which I think is related to comprehension, is making sure that kids see the link between yes. phonics and speaking. Yes. So we do, I think, see, and this varies by classroom but and curriculum, but I think we do see sometimes that phonics curriculums are a separate part of the of the literacy block, right? They're mm -hmm. a separate part of instruction. And I don't I don't think that's bad. Um, you know, as Andrea said, like kids need opportunities for direct explicit instruction mm -hmm. with phonics. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but then we need to make sure that there are opportunities for kids to then see, um, you know, patterns, for example, um, in the context of connected text and connected text that that matters to them, which you know, sometimes that's that can be decodables, but then also beyond just decodables, which are largely for them to practice mm -hmm. the patterns that they know, which is really important. But then also, are they are they having opportunities for teachers to point out or for them to realize, oh, here's this text I really am interested and excited about, and oh, look here in the title, there's this uh, this pattern that that um, you know we just learned about last week or that we mm -hmm. learned about last month. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important part of the meaning making puzzle, and it's something mm -hmm. Andrea mentioned earlier that kids um, need to be motivated to to want to read for their own purposes, right? Mm -hmm. It's like reading doesn't matter, phonics doesn't matter unless it allows me to do something that I care about as a reader. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we do want to be mindful of, you know, phonics instruction in isolation. We want to make sure. sure we're carrying it back to comprehension instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, as as I said, I think comprehension instruction should should really center not on comprehension as the end goal, but mm -hmm. on content as the end goal, on, on actual um, interesting, authentic, disciplinary, or or like by disciplinary, I just mean content problems. Mm -hmm. And that, that could be things kids care about. Those could be mm -hmm. problems or issues embedded in a, in a kid's community. It could be learning about a topic that a kid is interested in, which is something we see a lot in elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, and, and learning things like comprehension strategies, for example, mm -hmm. in the service of and in the context of these authentic um, content problems or, or objectives that kids are working on so that, you know, skills and strategies, they serve the real authentic purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not always the case that kids have the opportunity to engage in content that that's exciting to them and that matters to them. Sometimes we we do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think, you know, it's not just that we're going to give kids instruction only in the things that they're already interested in, right? Sure. Part, part of teaching is getting kids excited and motivated and interested in new topics right. too. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, so just kind of to wrap this up a little bit, um, you know, what kind of advice would you give to school districts or teachers or parents who are trying to help a struggling reader? What would you recommend um, that they do? You have a, a person who's hesitant, a reader who doesn't want to read, uh, you know, a kid with ADHD that just doesn't want to sit and do or do anything, doesn't want to read. Um, what what kinds of advice would you give them to, to make this a little more palatable for, for those kids who are hesitant? Yeah, to the districts. Yeah. So I want to say, in addition to, to to making that link, this is going to be related, I promise. Okay. <laughs> in addition to making the link between phonics and comprehension for the students, I think there's also the piece where this is one of the reasons that Elena and I, or that I think we 
like the active view because mm -hmm. um, Duke and Cartwright so specifically name the bridging skills, right? Yeah. These skills like fluency and vocabulary that aren't specifically about word recognition or aren't specifically about comprehension, but actually are both. And mm -hmm. so I think there's a piece where we have to be thinking about um how we are setting kids up to understand the domains, even if they're not naming them as domains, right? Sure. But to understand how to coordinate these skills. Mm -hmm. And so this, I think, also relates to struggling readers, where we need a full, comprehensive understanding of what literacy is and, and what comprehension is, right? Mm -hmm. And and when Elena and I talk about comprehension, I think we're really also trying to think about deep comprehension, not mm -hmm. the sort of basic superficial level comprehension mm -hmm. that's involved with like beach reads or recipes, but right. really like how to engage with text and th synthesize and evaluate mm -hmm. and perspective take. And mm -hmm. so I think it, my, my perspective on this is if you have a reader who is struggling, I think really doing a lot of assessment to understand what does that mean that they are yeah. struggling? It's like right. struggling where and with mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. Um, if you, we can think about not just the five pillars, but mm -hmm. also the relationship between these pillars and then mm -hmm. the other um, dimensions like motivation, right? Mm -hmm. And and metacognition that might not be explicitly named. Mm -hmm. Really, I think trying to pinpoint, because I think with struggling readers, you can imagine this will get very overwhelming very mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we have no motivation to right. continue. Right. Right. People right. need to experience some level of success, yes. right? Yes. Have to have something that they're able to do that's satisfying and that's joyful mm -hmm. and that makes them feel successful. And I mm -hmm. wonder oftentimes if we can create these profiles that um, that look at sort of a full picture of who a child is as a reader, mm -hmm. are we potentially better set up to then address where they're struggling? Because we can also identify where they're successful and where they're doing yes. well. Yeah. So that would be one thing that I would say. Yeah. That's yeah. And completely agree with all of that. Um, you know, I, I think that all, all children are motivated to read mm -hmm. in certain contexts and ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are different. So I think it's important for us as teachers to figure out, you know, where, what are those contexts where kids like to read? Mm -hmm. And by reading, I don't just mean reading a narrative, you know, a, a narrative, Text, but I think of reading and, and Andrea does too very broadly. You know, I also work a lot with digital literacies and mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. multimodality. So mm -hmm. how are we using image and video mm -hmm. um, and oral language? You know, as mm -hmm. we're as we're on a podcast now, some mm -hmm. people prefer to listen to their books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we we really live, especially in the academic world, in a place that privileges linguistic interpretation and comprehension, mm -hmm. which is fine, right? Like there are things that language does that image can't do, mm -hmm. but sometimes we forget that, wait a minute, an image can actually do quite a lot. Absolutely. And if we just look at the world that we live in as adults on the internet and, and elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, we engage in a lot of you know, meaning making that doesn't just involve right. linguistic comprehension. Right. So I think that right. is a very important piece is yes. understanding, um, you know, if I have a reader who is struggling, well, where are the places that they're not struggling? Yeah. And how can, you know, what what are their motivations for mm -hmm. reading? And how can we really leverage that? Yes, as a bridge to linguistic alphabetic comprehension, but also in its own right of mm -hmm. like in the 21st century, we make meaning in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to echo one thing Andrea said, which is around assessment, mm -hmm. um, rather than just, you know, teaching a, a single curriculum to all students, um, we need to assess students, right, to understand like what is mm -hmm. actually going on. We can't right. assume why a child is struggling. Um, but exactly. we have lots of assessments that allow us to understand where are they struggling. And then another thing Andrea said that I just think is so important that I try to impress on my students is that assessments often point out uh, the things students do wrong, right? Yeah. That's sort of how assessments are currently mm -hmm. designed. Mm -hmm. And so they make it almost harder for teachers to be able to start instruction with what students do right, right? Exactly. If I'm a student tell me what I can't do well, well, you know, I'm check, I'm checking out. Exactly. But if you tell me like, 
hey, Elena, you're great at this. Now you're ready for the next challenge. Right. Well, suddenly I might be more engaged. So I right. think that's really important. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of teachers mm-hmm. out there, you know, do that yeah. um, and recognize the importance of that. That's a great point, yeah. Elena. I, I, yeah. Think, I think too, you know, the whole idea of, of reading for pleasure also gets lost a lot in school. We're so focused on, you have to know how to read so you can learn. You have to know how to read. And and you lose the whole aspect of, gosh, this is fun to do. This mm-hmm. can be fun. And it always reminds me of um, of my daughter um, who who has ADHD. She's she's 32 years old now and she's mm-hmm. amazing. And but she went to college and it was a it was a it was a struggle, man. It was like she didn't want to go and she was my first and I'm like, you're going to go, <laughs> you know, and now looking back, maybe I should have done things differently. But anyway, she went to college and she, every semester, she was like, okay, I'm, I'm done. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do it. And then I called her one day and I said, you know, how's it going? And she said, great, mom, it's going great. I said, she said, you know, I haven't been to class in a couple of weeks though. And I'm like, oh my gosh, wh- what do you, what, <laughs> what's going on? She goes, mom, I started reading Harry Potter <laughs> and I can't put it down. And, and I'm telling you, this girl never read a book K through 12. She did not. She hated it. She wasn't going to do it. She wasn't motivated. She wasn't mm-hmm. finding anything interesting. She said she started picking up Harry Potter and read the whole thing, didn't go to class, just sat there and read. And from that moment, and I was like, that's awesome, Mamie. I'm so happy for you. Don't go to school. Finish, finish reading <laughs> Harry Potter. That's more important than anything right now, you know. And so she finished Harry Potter, and she's been pretty much a, a reader ever since. Like she's, she picks up, she just, it, wow. it got lost. The message yeah. in school got lost somewhere, you know, that it's, it's so important for you to have to be good at something, but also to enjoy it. And, and so, and it, it's, 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 mm-hmm. it's amazing. And she's gone on to, you know, get her bachelor's and go back to school and become a registered nurse. And she's been continuing on, you know, yep. Um, something sparked in her that that she was successful at something and she enjoyed something. And that, I think, is what kind of goes along with what you bo- both yeah. were saying earlier. And, I, and I, she was motivated by what she loved. She was right? motivated yeah. by something super interesting yeah. to her. Right, yes. I, I, think I love that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Andrea. No, I was just going to say, we in the article, in the Edweek article, we reference um, Goldie Muhammad's framework. I think this is like coming up for me right now because mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. love Goldie Muhammad's work and her whole idea that the historically responsive literacy framework, it's like there's these five pursuits and one of them is joy. Yeah, It's like you should always be accounting Mm -hmm. for joy in your Mm -hmm. instruction, which I think sometimes sort of gets like treated as not serious, right? Mm -hmm. Or not rigorous. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is that what we know is, is that if students are not motivated, if they're not finding Mm -hmm. this joyful or pleasurable, it's going to be a struggle, right? Exactly. And so I, I just love the way that um, Goldie Muhammad it accounts for identity and thinks about skills like fluency and phonics, mm-hmm. but but using them in the service of, you know, critically examining systems of power and developing our own identities and understanding who we are in relationship to the world and finding joy in all of that. Like mm-hmm. that should be the reason that we teach reading in schools. But you're right. We sometimes get so mired in the building blocks that we mm-hmm. forget. Yes. And then we do such a disservice to mm-hmm. the kids because they don't know that this can be joyful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that point about joy and identity. And your story just about your daughter like reminds me too that the motivation and the joy and the identity, like they have to come first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which I think sometimes we think of them as like, oh, we'll do that like alongside instruction. Yeah, yeah. true. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah. That's such a great point. Yeah, I think that's a great way to end this. Yes, um, I think on so joy, right? Let's <laughs> let's move on and be um, teaching kids that this is a great fun thing. Um, thank you so much for for coming on and talking with us. We really appreciate it. And I think what a, a good idea might be, you guys, um, to um, put um, maybe the active view of reading model 
in the show notes if we can, Mm -hmm. because I know not a lot of people are familiar with that. And and it might be good for them to see this if they, as they're listening to the the podcast. So if, if we could put that up, that'd be great too. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you though. Again, um, ladies, it's been really, um, very great talking with you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. To both thank, of you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Mm-hmm. We yeah. appreciate the opportunity yeah. to chat. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're going to kind of move on. You guys can hang out and listen for a bit this if you want to. But um, this is um, kind of like to talk about what's going on in the news a little bit. And it's not nearly as heady as what we've been talking about. <laughs> but um, there, there, um, there's a story that came out in the Smithsonian. Um, and it's enti- entitled, Scientists Discover a Phonetic Alphabet Used by Sperm Whales moving one step closer to decoding their chatter. And so um, this is a, what they're, what they're thinking is going on is that these whales have their, have a language and it's a code-based language (laughs) and they're talking to each other. And I think this is, I don't know why I think this is so, it's so fun to think about. (laughs) Um, But um, I think um, what they're doing is they, it's almost sounds like a, like a Morse code, Mm -hmm. like, certain sperm males whales have these little like clicking sounds and it's very code based and some some whales are have different other sounds but um they've analyzed these audio recordings and and found that um they they're they're finding patterns they're finding patterns patterns and noises and they believe that the whales may have some kind of phonetic alphabet that could be communicating in their own language and possibly even in full sentences so um, we do have we do have a recording of it. So could you play that, Mike? It it might be a little tricky to hear, but listen for the clicks. I don't know if you if Andrea and El- Elena could hear that. It might be because of our Zoom thing, but um, um, it it just pretty much just sounded like a lot of clicking going on, and um, I just think that's hilarious. It's, it's, I, every time I think about it, I it's think amazing. it's amazing. I think it's hilarious because of what are the, what the heck are they talking about? They, you know, like what are these what are these whales saying to each other? I mean, probably. They're talking about phonics and comprehension, right? <laughs> All so. right. Or they're saying, you know, hey, honey, can you uh, stop by and pick up some, you know, krill on the way home from the store or whatever? I don't know. What are or they that, saying? Right. What the heck are they talking about? Hey, Judy, did you hear what, you know, I mean, what are they saying to each other? Well, what, it, so what did um, somebody mention, one of the guys mentioned, that they live to over 100? Is it over 100 years old? So... I mean, they've they've got a lot of life experience. They have a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, exactly. And then and then I, and then I was just reading just this past week about elephants too. So uh, apparently, elephants um, they they have unique sounds that um, that that they address to very specific other elephants, meaning that mm-hmm. they have names for each other. And when they, when an elephant makes a very specific sound, a very specific elephant will, re, will respond. Be, and so we're thinking, they're thinking that there's something going on there too. So I just, I just think all this is, is, you know, these animals are going to take over the world because yeah. they probably have a better idea about things than we do, you know, what the heck. Um, so, so that's kind of just a fun, I love fun it. little in the I news. Love, I so. love elephants. And I, I, I was just saying to Esther, I'm like, I feel like. Dogs talk to each other. All the animals are busy talking to each other. We just haven't figured out what they're saying. Right. Exactly. And the trees. The trees are talking to each other. You're right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Why do we think we're the only ones talking and talking about, you know, you know, we, we, we need to be more respectful. Um, Anyway, so um, that's all we have for today. And thank you again for joining us and, and, um, Watch for the show notes um, and the models. And, and of course, if you have any questions about anything or comments, just let us know. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you for listening to the Orton Gillingham podcast, a Brainspring production. For additional content, please subscribe to our newsletter, visit our website at brainspring.com, or follow us on social media. To submit questions or comments, please email us at podcast at brainspring.com. Your feedback is always welcome.